What a day mother has had. Uh, hello and welcome to The Kids Are Asleep on Slates.com. I'm Jamila Lemieux. Uh, I am a co-host of Slate's Mom and Dad Are Fighting and a contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column. And the mom to Naima, who is seven, Naima, uh, going on 17 and alternately 37, depending on the day of the week. And um, let me just tell you, motherhood really kicked my ass today. Like I'm kind of in a state, of, I don't know, I just got home not too long ago, um, had to go to the doctor, run a couple of errands and take Naima to her dad. Um, and today's his birthday, shout out to my baby father for being born and for, you know, getting me pregnant. And like, you know, we just had some logistical challenges with coordination for handoff and stuff. And I was stressed and trying to, you know, ensure that they had as much of the day together as possible, um, you know, because it's his birthday or whatever, even though she's been with him the majority of the time for the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, it's his birthday, so I wanted to make sure that it was all gravy or whatever. So anyway, just some challenges in dealing with that. And like through those challenges, I was, you know, I was stressed out. And, um, you know, my daughter really tested. Well, my patience was tested. And like when we talk about our kids testing us, it so often comes from, you know, almost like we're implying that they've done something wrong. And sure, of course they do things wrong, Like, but they're supposed to do things wrong because they're children, right? So it's not like, wow, my patience is really being tested. Can I deal with this kid anymore? Can this particular child or these particular children uh, work any more of my nerves? Or you know, do I have what it takes to get through this? But it's like, it's that part. It's not a test of, of your threshold for them or, or what they're up to. It's your capacity to deal with what children do, right? Like most of the stuff that drives us nuts about our kids is not beyond the pale. It's not that unique, you know? Um, I can tell you from answering parenting advice questions for uh, almost two, well, about a year and a half now that a good majority of the inquiries we get are very similar to other inquiries we've gotten, you know, and, and the challenges that our readers are facing are challenge similar to challenges that uh, myself and the other folks who write the column um, or who, uh, who host mom and dad are fighting the same stuff we're dealing with. And of course, there's a reason that uh, people who write for Slate and people who listen to or read Slate would have similar issues, but you get what I'm saying. Like, we know that our terrible, horrible, driving us crazy kids are not terrible or horrible in any way. They're just kids and kids are inherently terrible and horrible, but our kids aren't unique for being terrible and horrible. So like, there's no reason for you to be uniquely frustrated or challenged by them, right? Like they're simply completing the process of going from infancy to adulthood. And along the way, it is making mistakes. It is having a complete lack of social skills and regard for other human beings, namely the human beings who love them the most. And um, yeah, there are days where you just look at yourself and it's like, am I up for this chat? Am I good enough at this? You know, something that Stacey Ann Chen, the brilliant poet, activist, um, creator, uh, shared in a, a poem that she posted on, I think it's from her, uh, from Motherstruck, but she shared it on Facebook re or uh, Instagram recently. And she was talking about um, gazing upon her daughter during these moments of stress where she's questioning her parenting, where she's questioning other things that are going on in her life. Um, you know, where, where she's dealing with challenges and yet has this majestic, wonderful little person, uh, her, her beautiful daughter in front of her. And she's one of the things that she says in the poem that just has kind of haunted me, this one line uh, all week since I read it, what will she say about being raised by me? And I want for so badly for my daughter to say, you know, I can't say only good things because that's unrealistic. And I and I am somebody who has phenomenal parents, and I cannot only say good things about how they raised me and some of the choices that they made in raising me. But I but I have phenomenal parents, so no, she can't only say good things because if she had to stop talking right now, you know, or if the story ended, God forbid, right now, she wouldn't only be able to say good things. So there's no way that I, that I'd only want her to say good things about me. But I want her to overwhelmingly, you know, say that she 
enjoyed being raised by me and, and that I treated her gently and made her feel good and safe and happy and whole at all times. And it's hard to like make somebody else feel safe and happy and whole at all times when you're not always feeling that way yourself, you know? And like, that's not unique to me in any way. Like with what's going on in the world right now, everybody's going through it. I don't know anybody who feels totally fulfilled and totally safe and totally happy, right? There may be things that are making us happy. There may be, you know, um, things that we feel secure in, but in general, the world around us is very unstable. And for many of us, it's always been somewhat unstable, right? Like I'm a black woman. I've always been one bad moment, one officer having a, a shitty day because he was fighting with his, oh, I hope I'm not frozen like that the way I'm frozen on my computer because it is the ugliest me I've ever seen. Oh, and I remember 16 year old me. Um, but anyway, like that I could be one, you know, nervous or angsty or, or tired police officer's bad day away from ruin, that I could be, you know, one Karen's day away, you know, bad day or, or uh, itchy 911 dialing finger away from getting in trouble, you know, like that any number of things that my career can just be taken away from me because of a, a slip of the tongue or, you know, um, pissing off the wrong person. Like that's just the world in which we live and, and we live with that. And yeah, we got to keep these little people afloat. And right now, shit is super crazy. Things are so crazy. This has been the least craziest week in quite some time, perhaps because the bad crazy was balanced out in a lot of ways by the good crazy. Anyway, all that's to say, for those of you who are struggling, for those of you who are questioning the quality and the, um, the, the temerity of your parenting right now, just know you are not alone. I was going to quote the song, you are all, you are not alone, but I forget that it was written for Michael Jackson by R. Kelly uh, and apparently about a teenage girl having an abortion um, of a pregnancy that he caused and him not being there for her and then writing this song. So um, trying to borrow that little ditty from the uh, halls of my mind you are not singular in the struggle for I too am also struggling as well. But on a much lighter note, I've got a wonderful guest who's here with us tonight, uh, another Howard University Bison. Yes, there have been a few on the show and there will be a few more. Uh, Howard University Bison, we are everywhere. In fact, we are uh, moving into wherever the vice president lives, if you don't know. Uh, but my guest tonight, Courtney Taylor, uh, is, oh my God, you know what's funny? I was about to say, oh, does Courtney have a cat too? Because I was thinking about Courtney and then I look at the screen, but I realized that that's my little cat. Um, shout out to Candy Girl. Candy Girl had to be rushed to the ER last week. Like she's been going through it. So I, um, shout out to her. She's a very expensive uh, member of the family now. She, she officially has cost as much um, to be, still alive as it cost me to deliver Naima, but she's here and we're happy for that. Um, anyway, my guest tonight, Courtney Taylor, is a multi-hyphenate educator, a mother, a an activist, uh, and just a phenomenal human being in all ways. And uh, she's got a really powerful story of how she became an activist and how her son's uh, diagnosis with diabetes changed their family in a lot of really powerful ways. So if we could please, please welcome dear Courtney Taylor to the stage. Hi, Courtney. <laughs> hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. Uh, that intro and your story, listen, today could not be a more perfect day for me to hear that because the way Chase has been trying me and Carter has been trying me in 2020, it's Ooh, child. Are you all in school physically? Are your kids in school physically? No, they're at home. Good. I mean, good, but like, whoo. Right. And that that's the thing. Like, they are at home and I want to keep them at home because I want to keep them alive. Yes. However, they're driving me crazy. So it's like... Courtney, turn your mic up a little bit if you can. I, I don't know how. Oh, no. Can you hear me more? Yeah, so you might just have to speak up. Uh, you might just have to speak up a little bit. 
I can hear you fine, but I guess they're hearing you on the back end that well. Um, yeah, like I had one, I had a feeling because whenever we get to connect, um, I feel like we're in the same, we're like either in the same place with the kids or like one of us just got out and is like, girl, listen, you're going to be good. I know because I was just there last week. Just hold on, you know, like, no. but right now, the like, <sighs> It's a lot. This whole, it's a lot. And it's, it's, I know that the kids are going through it too. And that's the thing I have to remind myself that like these kids, we got to finish second grade, you know, like we got to do like things that they, like they won't have that back. They won't have second, like Naima's second right. grade year, Carter's uh, fifth, third. Carter's third, and um, Chase's fifth. Chase is not in seventh grade. Seventh grade. Get out. Right. Girl, listen, filling himself. I'm He's sure. Where did he make it to A3? So I want, before we, I want to hear more about what seventh and third grade look like together, uh, especially during the pandemic. But I want to go um, a little earlier in Carter's life, and I'm sorry, Chase's life, and talk about uh, what happened when you found out that he, how did you find out that he was sick? Uh, wait, so you guys can't hear me. Can you hear me now? I think we're good. They said they can hear you now. All right. Um, so you said, how did I find out he was sick? So he, like, quick um, kind of story. QB's wedding. Um, mm -hmm. He was in a wedding around the time, like, the weekend of his wedding. Chase was going to the bathroom a lot. He was having accidents. Um, it was How old was he? He was three. He was three. Yep. He was having a lot of changes happening that I was noticing. Then I went away on vacation. Things were getting worse where, while I was away where he was still having accidents. He was thirsty the, like all day long. I attributed it to it just being the summertime and, you know, it's hot. He's thirsty. Um, <clears throat> come home. Same thing is happening. So I was like, let me write down how many times he goes to the bathroom. So from, and this, it was literally 5 p.m. to 5, 17 p.m. He went to the bathroom like 21 times. Oh my god! And gosh. it was like full, like, like, yeah, real going to the bathroom. I had to go, yeah. Right. So I took him to the ER. I'm thinking, you know, he has an infection or whatever. And they like rushed him to the back, um, did test. And they told me that he has type 1 diabetes. And literally within that moment, like life just flipped and did a complete change it went from us you know being able to go to the park or being able to go to dance class or swimming or whatever just like getting up getting out the house and going to now um nine years later like we have to make sure we have all types of supplies needles and syringe uh, uh, lancets and insulin and juices and a whole list of things just to leave the house just to make sure you know he makes it back um how how much of that did he understand at three? Oh, none of it. Like we, I literally every single time we had to. So to check his blood sugar, we uh, prick his finger with and mm -hmm. a needle like maybe this long. Now he does it without like he will have a whole conversation with you and he's doing it. And he doesn't flinch. Mm -hmm. But at three years old, you he couldn't get anything done by himself. Like there had to be more than one adult. So to check his blood mm -hmm. sugar, to give him insulin, anything like there had to be another adult. So somebody had to hold him down while the mm -hmm. other adult had to do that. And at three, like he didn't understand it. He felt like all of the adults in his life, in his life were trying to hurt him just for him to uh. eat. Yeah, it was horrible. And like, you know, we had to, it got to a point where, um, and this was only like months after he was diagnosed, where we would have to give him warnings. So if he was going to eat at 12, I had to start prepping him at 11. And I would say mm -hmm. like, Chase, you're going to eat lunch at 12. That means I'm going to check your blood sugar and I'm going to give you insulin 11, 15. Chase, you're like same mm -hmm. thing every 15 yeah. minutes because he would get so anxious and so worked up. Like think about, you know, when a kid is getting their flu shot or when they have yeah. to get any type of vaccine is like, <gasps> and having to do that three times, times a day. A day. Five times a day. Because he has to eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then two snacks. So either a snack mm -hmm. between breakfast and lunch and lunch and dinner or right before bedtime. Um, so it all 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 day. Like 
And it's hard. Like, I would literally cry every single time. Like, I would do it, and then I would run upstairs, and I would close the bathroom door and cry, mm-hmm. and wipe my face, and come back down and try to be a mom. It's hard. It was, yeah. it was hard for a couple of years. So, <laughs> I'm sure what... um. So knowing that you already have that challenge in front of you, you decide to create an organization to address diabetes in children. So like, what made you want to take on a bigger challenge in addition to this new, you know, normal that you had to adjust to? And and how old was Chase when you started the organization? And what exactly do you all do? Please tell everyone about your mission. I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm not setting it up for you well, but I just, I'm like, I just, I want every piece that my journalist has on. I want every piece of the story. I'm like, so what did he, you know, what inspired you? And then, but, um, but yes, let's start with uh, what did motivate you to um, become an activist and to start uh, supporting other families that are going through what you all are going through? So it was actually Chase's idea. And it was really Chase's idea. Not like the memes that we see where they're like, I like my, my five-year-old. <laughs> no, they didn't. Yeah. It was really Chase's idea. So we... Um, he wasn't... We mean it like me and my mom. We're watching the news. And there was like this uh, Michael Jackson dance sign that was on TV, like some school did a dance sign. And at that point, mm-hmm. Chase literally thought he was Michael Jackson's like best friend. Um, oh. And so Chase, and it was right before his birthday. I want to say it was in like Feb- January or February. It was a, a few, mm-hmm. like not more than two months before his birthday. And um, Chase was like, oh, for my birthday, I want to have a Michael Jackson party like that. So I was mm-hmm. like, okay. And so as it got closer to his birthday, I was like, so what are we going to do for your birthday? And he was like, I told you I want to have a Michael Jackson party. And mm-hmm. I explained to him that what we saw on the news was like a fundraiser. And I was like, they were raising money to help somebody else. So if we do this, you have to make it so that we're raising money to help somebody else. So what do you want to do? And he was like, well, I want to raise money and I hand to God. He was like, I want to raise money for other kids who have diabetes, who don't have a mom and a nurse like me. I was like, (laughs) so we had, see, I don't, those memes when everybody's like, no kids said that I'm like, no, Uh, some of those start like when people say, I'm like, I know your kid, my kid, like our kids are sophisticated. They say smart stuff all the time. If you talk to your kids like people as opposed to babies, they'll make a full sentence on you. Exactly. Um, So we had a Michael Jackson dance design for his fourth birthday. Um, And QB came, QB again, shout out to QB. Mm -hmm. DJ DJ Premonition, Premonition. (laughs) one of the best DJs in the... One of the best DJs in the DMV area. Uh, Absolutely. DC area. Um, so he came all the way to Philly and Chase told him, you can only play Michael Jackson mu- music. And <laughs> he had a dance sign. We only raised like, I say like two, three hundred dollars. Like it wasn't a lot, mm-hmm. but we, Chase did it. Like he, yeah. thing was his idea. Um, and we donated it to CHOP Diabetes Center. Um, mm-hmm. And then after that, Chase kept saying, like, what else are we going to do? What else are we going to do? And I was like, all right, well, let's make this a real thing. So we birthed the Chase Away Diabetes Foundation. Um, so it was his idea. We birthed it. It's been my vision and my goal for it. Like, I haven't gotten there yet. Um, mm-hmm. We do in the summertime. I do like back to school, uh, like fundraisers and festivals for kids and give away book bags and all of that, but also to like raise awareness about diabetes through that. We do uh, call to Congress each year. And granted is usually just like me and Chase, but through that, all of like our friends and family and other other advocates we've met like within this arena where we're, you know, raising awareness and influencing other people to be advocates for type one. Um, and then talking about just like, healthy eating and you know what you're putting in your body and all of it it's just all become just like one big old um party (laughs) and it's a wonderful party um courtney what's the difference between type one and type two you know which is something that we should all know by now but it's not something that's talked about often enough and we hear when we think of diabetes oftentimes we think of you know in the black community is the sugar 
right? So yeah. we're talking about type two diabetes and a lot of us know the things that we should be doing to prevent that. But you know, type one diabetes is certainly not something that many of us will be thinking of our children having, especially if we don't have it ourselves. So what do we need to know about type one and type two, particularly as it relates to kids? Yep. So the difference between the biggest difference that you can that or the easiest way to think of it with people who have type one diabetes, your pancreas decides to just go to sleep and is like, eh, I quit. I'm not working anymore. And therefore is not producing the insulin that your body needs in order to break down the foods that you eat. So this drink that I'm drinking, the dinner that And I'm what are you eating, drinking, by the way? So this is Jack Daniels and ginger ale. Very nice. Okay, I'm doing yeah. Myers and uh, Pepsi. Sorry, we forgot we to go. tell the people at the beginning. Here yep. we go. Cheers. That's that's cheers. That's also, those are like hard mom drinks for like a Thursday night. Like that shows okay. you. Like It's been a rough week. This ain't no wine, okay? It's been a rough week. <laughs> it's a lot of rum in this cup. <laughs> yep. Oh heck yeah. Um, so with type one, you're so when you're when I'm when you're drinking, you're eating, the food goes in your body, your pancreas helps it to break down so that you it takes the energy that it needs from whatever you're consuming and it mm -hmm. sends it wherever it needs to go and then everything else you digest. Chase's pancreas and others who have type one diabetes, it doesn't work anymore. And therefore mm -hmm. they're not producing insulin. So when Chase, if Chase eats a slice of pizza and he does not give himself insulin, um, it spikes his blood sugar and you know, it, one, it can cause a lot of complications within his body, but the immediate um, impact that it has, he gets a headache, his vision mm -hmm. is really blurry, um, his speech is slurred, he's very, very moody and cranky, he doesn't have energy because he has his pizza and all of the carbs, typically a slice of pizza is 63 carbs. Um, he has a pizza, he has all of these carbs in his body that are just not doing anything that it's supposed to do. Um, so those who, and I don't use the word diabetics, which is why I won't say diabetics, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Those who have, because diabetes does not define my kid. Right. He has diabetes. He's a person he with diabetes. Him. Exactly. Yes. Um, so those with type one, they're insulin dependent. So in order for them to survive every single day, in order for them to live and wake up, they need insulin. Those with type two diabetes, they're not necessarily uh, insulin dependent. So some may be, and it depends on the severity of um, the chronic illness within their body, but food and their diet can help to cure their diabetes. Um, they may be on a low insulin amount regimen. They may just have to take pills. They may um, have to be on an insulin pump for a certain amount. But those with type one, which is what Chase has, which is, it used to be called juvenile diabetes. However, you can get it at any, any point in your life, um, which is Oh, that's, I was yeah. going to ask about that. So type one is some, okay. I was going to ask, I, I thought it was something that were you born with type one, but so you can develop type one at any point. Exactly. Exactly. So okay. you can get it when you're 17, you can get it when you're 42, you can get it when you're 91. Um, so it's so that doesn't mean that Chase had it from birth. That means he developed it around the time he was diagnosed because exactly. it shows up relatively quickly. Okay. Yep, exactly, exactly. Um, but also, like, there are a lot of parents that I've talked to whose kids have type 1 where they've been able to say, like, even though they were diagnosed at this point, this is when I think they got it. So mm. Chase was diagnosed August 21st, 2011. But I definitely think that he started getting diabetes or his pancreas stopped working in June um, of that year because yeah. he was in a recital and there were like different signs that I was seeing that as I thought back on it, I was like, oh, that's when it started. Um, so, yeah, that's the difference. So uh, tell us a little bit about what Chase's daily routine is like now. Um, how much is he able to do on his own? Does he still have to uh, test five times a day? Yep. So this is why Chase is trying me. Chase okay. is 12 years old. He's a preteen. Mm -hmm. And he has all the preteen things happening on top of living with a chronic illness. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and Chase has reached the point that a lot of parents warned me about um, where I'll ask him if he checked his blood sugar and he'll say yes. And then that is, two hours that's later, I find out that he did not. Yep. Mm. Um, and, you know, because playing Fortnite is more fun, playing basketball outside is more fun. Um, mm-hmm. Sitting on a couch watching his phone and YouTube is more fun than checking yeah. your blood sugar and giving yourself insulin. Um, when So I said that Chase was diagnosed when he was three. Around four and a half, close to five, I taught him how to check his blood sugar. So he was able to do that on his own. Um, mm-hmm. he, he went to diabetes camp for like about five years. So starting mm-hmm. at seven up until, mm-hmm. or like four years up until last year, what's his last mm-hmm. year. Um, and he learned how to give himself insulin, his second year diabetes camp. So when he was like eight or nine, um, so he's, he's extremely independent when it comes to diabetes management. He's mm-hmm. not responsible when it comes to diabetes management. So he can do everything. He can calculate carbs. He mm-hmm. can convert his insulin to carb ratio. So he can tell you if I'm eating 40 carbs, then I know I need four units of insulin. If you know my blood sugar is 282, I know that I need this amount of insulin, you know, to cover it. He can tell you all of that. He can draw up insulin in a syringe. He can administer insulin. He gives himself a needle. Mm-hmm. Literally everything. He can do all that. Bottom. All of it. But he's not what are the thing? What are the things that he's not responsible about? Like, does he overeat or undereat, or or is that not an issue? Is it just the measurement and the insulin? So he, if I'm not sitting right next to him, he won't do it. So he will. He'll cook his food. He can tell you how many carbs carbs he's eating. He just will not check his blood sugar, right before because he's my kid is so like one track mind mm-hmm. right now I am hungry so I'm going to eat I don't care mm-hmm. about anything else right now yeah. I'm going to play my video game so I'm going to play this video game and I don't care about anything else um, so he'll he'll eat what he's supposed to eat he will um, he'll know and he'll know he won't add them up on pen and paper he'll add them up in his mm-hmm. head um, which is why I don't understand how he has a CMS but whatever <laughs> 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 he'll add them up in his head, but he won't check his blood sugar. So he could be 600 mm-hmm. and not give himself insulin. He could be 40 and not treat it and not get yeah. juice or candy. Like he'll just eat. I'm hungry and I want to eat. So I'm going to eat. Um, so that's where the irresponsibility comes in. And that's what's driving me crazy. Cause I'm like, dude, I want you to live. I want you to be, I want you to, live. I, I want you to be 25 and you know, have kidneys and have both of your feet and have your eyesight. And I mean, you know, he's 12 and he's not looking that far ahead, but I am. And it's like, except for me literally sitting beside you all day long. And I mean, it's 2020. Uh We're in a pandemic. I'm a single mom. I'm also raising an eight-year-old. I'm also Mm -hmm. trying to open a school. I'm also trying to like work two jobs, keep us alive, sleep every now and then. Like, yeah, uh, help, help me out. Help me out. Help me out. And that, Courtney, like, I had that conversation with my daughter today. I literally, like, I cried. It was a whole thing, you know? And I felt bad because I, like, I had been testy with her and I felt very bad about it, you know? Because, you know, when we, we're not whoop ass, like, you know, pun- right. everything is punitive moms. Like, that old right. school, like, there's a lot of old school black mama wisdom and energy in <laughs> us, but we don't have that whole. You know, you blinked some yeah, whoop your it. ass. Yep. Yeah, yep. like well, you know, like that Cat Williams uh thing, joke about the Skittles. Like, why are you mad at the baby asking for Skittles? That's what they're supposed <laughs> to do. They Skittle. Like, why are you like that type of we're not that mom, right? Like we're 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 woo woo woo, you know, like and a little yeah. bit indulgent, you know, like I feel like that's true of you too, right? Like mm-hmm. they're your kids a little spoiled, not big spoiled, but a little spoiled, like a little little sprinkle spoiled. So they're spoiled and they're privileged. And I'm trying to get them to understand that and recognize, yeah. like, just like we talk about white privilege, I also need you to recognize your privilege and understand, Absolutely. understand it. Because my kids Absolutely. Think that the lives that they live is normal. It's not. It's not. I'm like, most, like, 
She says something about somebody like, oh, because they only buy clothes, you know, they only go to the store, you know, once or twice a week or something or once or twice a month. I was like going clothes shopping once or twice. I was like, who, you think the average family goes clothes shopping once or twice a month? Are you out of your, like, really? Do you think that's normal? Not, first of all, like, Naima, Naima party who? Bye. Naima's <laughs> life is a fairy tale. And I tell her that all the time. I like, I just want you to know that oh. don't nobody live like this. And there's people that got more money than you. Like and there's people. We did not live like this. Like, just know, like, just the way that all the magic in your little life is lined up for you is very different, you know? And a big part of that is us going to Howard University and just all of the, the things that you're, the dots you're able to connect and the people you're able to meet and now you're able to bring them to your child's life. I do want to uh, have a couple Howard questions for you. But before we get to that, um, I'm curious to know what are the experts saying to you about how to address that irresponsibility in a, um, you know, in a preteen. That's something I just, you know, with, I have a seven, you know, almost eight year old. And I think about like how headstrong she is. And oh, what I was saying uh, a minute ago, which, which connects to this, um, I had that talk with Naima. When you listed all the things you're doing, you're like, I got this job, I got this family, I got this, 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 all of this on my plate, and I'm trying to stay, just stay alive. You know, like, we, I had a moment. I said, Naima, I said, you have to realize that, like, I'm in charge of me as well, like, as a single mom. Like, I'm not trying to put no burden on you, because I also have told her, I was like, you know, single moms, this, this statistics show that single moms do less housework than married moms, that, that like, because married moms are also caring for their, even if they work, right. they're expected to care for their husbands and serve. That's just still the norm, you know? So how, no matter how progressive y'all are and try to balance stuff right. out, more likely than not, the mom is carrying more than her load of the parenting, more than her load of the housework. And so I've explained that to her. And she said, she was like, why? You say you want to be married. Why? <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, because it can be a beautiful thing. I was like, I know. She was like, I don't understand. You, you have men are so bad. And I was like, well, just because patriarchy is bad. I was like, I had to really like dial back since I was okay. Yep. Just yep. like, you think because I said I hate men that I hate men. I don't hate men. I love men. I just also hate them. And I was like, you're going to have to learn that one day is to know men is to love and hate them at the same time. You know, Thank you gotta you. love it. Yeah. And like, and no matter how much you love them, you gotta love yourself more. Like as in general, you gotta love black women yeah. more than you love anybody else and the rest will fall into place. But anyway, yeah. but like, but but the whole, I was telling her, I was like, Naima, I'm responsible for me. Like nobody's, she was like, that's not true. You have a lot of friends and you don't talk to them that's, as much. She just cause she was like, people care about you. You just don't talk to your friends that much. And I was like, I haven't been talking to them as much lately. I said, but no, I'm talking about like somebody who, you know, like give an example, we moved across town recently. So the move, like I had to take care of every aspect of the move to call in the cable company and the light company and paying for the movers and packing up the boxes. I was like, everything that goes into the care of me and you when you're in my care is on me by myself and it's tiring. You know, it's exhausting. And like, so I don't want to burden you with that. I said, but I want you to contribute in the way, in an yeah. age appropriate way. I yeah. want you to, I went in her room. I was like, yo, you can't eat your room anymore. Cause she eats, sometimes she eats breakfast. And you know, if she, if she has a late breakfast, like she might be eating breakfast when school, you know, when class first yeah. starts or like, you know, eating a snack in there, or, you know, eating lunch in there. I went in there, I'm like, it's the plate of eggs from this morning that she didn't finish. Yes. It's a piece of the bread from lunch. I'm like, you, this is your room. And like, she doesn't think of her as her room because she thinks my room is her room, which is a whole other conversation, <laughs> you know? But I'm like, she said, it's our bed. I said, this is not our no, bed. Not. This is my it's bed not. that I allow you to sleep in sometimes and you're about to get the boot. Like, but anyway, but just, that is a place. She said that last night, I was like, she should have never said that. Cause like the fact that she thinks of it that way, but I should have known Courtney, cause she'll come in there. Like I had, I'm doing there. I'm in, I'm finally in therapy, which is, I'm very happy Amen. about being in like a, Amen. I'm in group, I'm in group therapy. Um, it's kind of like a group therapy slash life coach situation. Like all black women, uh, twice a week for six weeks. You know, so we'll see. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm optimistic. Yeah, like I'll send you her info for when she, I think she's yeah. going to do another cohort right after us. 
anyway, so and it was a good deal relative to what six weeks of therapy would cost. You right, know what I mean? Because right. most because most black therapists don't take insurance, which is a another kind. I get it, but I'm like, I need a therapist who takes sixty dollar, thirty dollar copays. Y'all want two hundred dollars right. every session, and then want to talk about come every week? Who's I got has an eight? Who got an eight hundred dollar therapy budget every month, my guy? Like, <laughs> come on. Either. Every oh. month, like if you two hundred dollars, we gonna do once a month, and I'm gonna still be tight about it, and it's probably not gonna be enough. <laughs> like I might need to like once a month, I'm gonna forget everything you say. I'm not gonna do my homework. I'm gonna come back in like uh. But anyway, um, we gonna start. We gonna start over, right? We gonna start over. But I got into this group therapy. So like I do it. So I'm sitting at my desk in my room, you know, and I told Naima to stay. Her. She knew I have this hour and a half on Monday and Wednesday. So like one of those days she's with her dad, the other day she's with me. I was like. You know, all I need to do is play play on the tab, whatever. I kind of gave her free, like, just do you. Just let me mm -hmm. be in therapy. She'll come sit in the bed. I was like, you know, there's a bed in your room. She was like, yeah, but it's kind of dark in there. I was like, okay, she does need a new light, a lamp or whatever. I was like, all right. I was like, the living room was well, kind of dark. Now, like, I didn't realize that the lights were just out in there. But she thinks of it as her bed. So anyway, she's, she's booted. Um, but with that, Courtney, like... I'm curious to know with, with all of that, you know, and that struggle to kind of get your kids to understand, like, it's not like I expect you to take care of me, but I want you to recognize how much I do to take care of you. Help recognize that no out. one else takes care of me. Just help me out. A little chore here and there. Like, it's not, it's not that much. Just don't, just don't be disgusting. Like, don't just like leave ketchup all over the couch and just act like you ain't see it, you know, like little stuff. But Courtney, how are you taking care of you right now? <laughs> <laughs> okay first of all all right <laughs> the fact yo self-care is such a joke i know it's, but self-care is, is such a joke it's such a joke let me tell you something you know what um okay so first of all let me rewind a little bit to my kids because all I would, like, I would just be over the moon if for, like, two weeks straight. It doesn't even have to be forever. Just for, like, two weeks straight, when I ask them to do something, they just do it. Or, like, when I ask them to do something, Chase has to say, oh, and mumble under his breath. Or, like, if they just didn't argue over the yeah. dumbest shit ever. Like, I'd be good. Two weeks? Give me two weeks. That's all. 14 days. Literally. Like, they can stop at day 14 in one minute just give me two weeks so that's not and it will feel like a vacation wait i have a question though it really will yes two it weeks really would will. feel like a vacation okay so they argue with each other do they argue with you because naima argues with me like we are two she teenagers in the house and she wants to and sometimes she brings me in i have to like pull myself back like i'm not arguing with like, the wait, goddamn wait, seven year old we're yep. not the same age oh. But do, do they argue with you? Because I wonder sometimes if she's arguing with me because she doesn't have anybody else to argue with. No, it's so they argue with each other. And um, the the crazy part about it is they argue with each other so well because I don't I don't know if it's because Carter is a girl and girls are normally more mature. If it's because Carter is so freaking smart and she's sassy as hell and she's from South Philly and she's just like thug life. I don't know what it is. So I say she's a Philly girl. She's like to the to the to the bone. Philly but, girls, for those of you who are not from who have not had the privilege of knowing a Philly woman, I'm gonna tell you something. And Courtney is one of oh my maybe th three that stand out from two that stand out in particular two that stand out from college. But when I think about like even my life post college, it's about four or five Philly women that I've come to really know and love, and with the exception of one of them. All I kind of had to like, it went from like, mm, no about this one to like, oh, I love her. She's the night, and it wasn't like, I don't know about you, because it, it was because I thought they were mean. You know, I thought y'all were mean. Like, you like you come you up hardcore. I did. I was like, I thought you were mean as hell. You're the night you would give anybody anything. Like, Philly women will do anything. They are the most loyal, hard, oh, so like, hard. committed. Like and that's kind of already. But she will also, but she will also Ooh. like read Chase for Phil, and so like they really? like Carter doesn't. She don't back down for anything. Like she will walk behind him and be like, "But I'm not done." <laughs> like, it's horrible. 
Chase doesn't argue with me. He'll just like mm-hmm. mumble or he'll get an attitude. But Carter, sometimes I forget that she's eight and I'm like, but who are you talking to? Meet me outside. How about that? <laughs> Does she the hand? Is she listen? Naima is seven. The the t- and I feel like this has been like a year. Like the really this past year is when it's been like the moments where I've had to really step back and be like, why are we doing this? Because I'm in charge here. And then the other day, like you know, she said something, and I told her what I felt about it, and that was it. And she was like. And she was like, you know what, though? I was like, you know what? I don't know. And I don't want to know because this is over. You know what, though? I didn't this know. is over. This is over. And she said, oh, she said, well, too bad you'll never know the truth. Yo, yo. <laughs> too bad you'll never know. Because she she basically was saying that whatever I assumed about what she was doing, you know, I thought she was being petty or something. I thought I was wrong. She was like, too bad too you'll bad never know the truth. Too bad you'll never know the truth. I said, I think yeah, I'll sleep at night. I said, I think I'll sleep at night, Naima. I think I'll be okay. She said, too bad. You'll never know. Your whole life, this whole conversation, you were just wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> I just, I almost scared. I had to roll down the window a little bit and just get some air. I was just like, no, my window doesn't part, do that. Like, I don't know why I did that. I have a button. It's, it's a sarcasm. The, it's a sarcasm it's, from people like who are not. sarcasm. It's the I was gonna say from people who are not a hundred percent clear on how the English language works, when you do get it correct, you are sassing the fuck out of me. Like you're treating me. Like the one time, like now you know all every word, everything is super clear when it's time for you. And there's also a lot of like Yes. Yep. Carter the she, Carter's eye, it's like her facial expression. She does a lot of who you side eyeing? Oh, who? <laughs> and it like Courtney, it's crazy because like, do you feel and um, I, I mean I'm having this experience and it's something that I've shared in talking to Naima's dad about that he's having it with both his children but also with Naima's brother who's a little boy because I thought maybe it was a gender thing but like. And I'm particularly curious about this with you and Chase, but I would imagine on some level it's Carter too, but like seeing the best and the worst of yourself all at once. Like see, like a lot of the time when Naima's really driving me crazy, the worst part of it is like, because she's really being mini Mila. Like when she's really acting like me, just not the me I want her to be. Yo, which is why also I said like me and Chase don't argue because Chase doesn't, Chase acts a lot like his dad. Car- and so the stuff that irks me is like, cause you're acting like him. Carter is like a hundred percent me. So, and it's also, which makes it hard for me to like actually discipline and raise her because I'm like, damn, what am I supposed to say? Cause right. it's like something like she, she's so quick with comebacks and it's just, it's sickening because I'm- It's impressive sometimes. Myself. And sometimes it's also very impressive. Cause kind of like, oh, you're the sh-. like, you're like me with more resources and like smarter and prettier. Smarter and let me tell you something. <laughs> way smarter than I she's ever way was. Smart. She's way smarter than I was probably at sixteen. Like the I, stuff that she that she picks up on and she says, I'm like, whatever. All right. <laughs> like know, today, she so like. Sickening. She reads me for feel. She tells me about myself, and like even when she's incorrect in her analysis, just the fact that she came up with it. Like today, she yeah. said, "What did she accuse me of being? Did she say you're being insecure or something like that?" Where it was like it wasn't quite right, but I was like, points were made. <laughs> like you gave me something to think about here, you know. So yeah. like, so Courtney, in the middle of raising these two brilliant beautiful dynamic funny lively children who and leading who also drive you crazy as children do and also leading a nonprofit, and also uh, managing you know and supporting chase and managing his illness you got two other jobs so i want to talk about briefly about your work as an educator and i'm curious to know how much can you share about this new move uh and if you can't that's fine we can just talk <laughs> no, about the current okay so let's hear it um okay so my other two jobs one i'm just a tutor on the side because again i'm a single mom and i'm an educator and they don't pay educators enough so there's that 
um, and I'm trying to buy a house. So, you know, there's that. Um, That's not just a tutor. Just, just is uh, like tutors are right. important. Yeah. Like I wish that we'd had the resources to, and I'm sure if there were programs and things that like, if I'd really spoke up times where I could have used tutoring, because when I was little and my parents were all in charge, like they wouldn't, you know, I was doing, I was high performing, but it was when I got a little bit older where it was kind of like, I probably could have benefited from that, but I wasn't going to say like, this is a little hard for me, <laughs> you know, but like shout, yeah. tutors do incredible work. And it's important yeah. work because kids are not getting that one-on-one -on -one from teachers more often than not. Like they're just not. Right. And side note, and I'll come back to like my, what I'm actually doing, but because me and my kids also argue during like homework and schoolwork time, Carter says to me, um, can you get me a tutor? But not you. I don't want you to tutor me. I want somebody else so we can actually get along. You're right. You're right. They're so rude. They're so rude. Said, They're so rude. First of all, I say, what do you need a tutor for? I mean, you know, because it'll just be fun. And just somebody to like work with me by myself without you. All right, Carter, whatever. I get the point. Just, so that's it. Just a not. I just need a not you. When is, is Carter's not an Aries too, is she? Carter no, her birthday's in the Okay, I was going to say her birthday's in the fall. I'm always trying to, I always am like, she's either Aries or she's around November because her birthday's around Halloween. Yep. Well, no, the month she's November twenty first. Oh, she's still okay. I guess Scorpio yep, and Sagittarius. Week. Okay, so she's oh and she, oh, and she is a Sagittarius. Like she will. That's ooh, baby, that singer. Listen, yes, Sagittarius. Okay. Sagittarius. So yes. So so in addition to being a tutor, what's the big? So I am an educator. I do instructional coaching, but right now and literally in. Five days, I will, four days, four days, I will be submitting a charter application to the school district of Philadelphia to open a school. Ah. Ah. Uh, so I'm applying for a kindergarten through fifth grade charter. So if they approve it, that means that I can open a school and I can welcome kindergartners all the way through fifth grade. Uh, we're going to open fall 2022. So not next school year, but the school year after. I found a building. Um, I wanted to be in South Philly, which is where I was born and raised, but I didn't find one there, which is fine. It just means, you know, God wanted me somewhere else. Um, uh oh, all right, there we go. Can you say uh, where? So yeah, so we'll we'll be in Logan, which is a section in North Philly, um, okay. on North Broad Street. The building is beautiful. Mm. Follow us. Underscore 2021 to see the building. It's so gorgeous. And literally, um, I've been doing like canvassing where I've just been dropping off flyers and info to like daycare centers and small businesses in the area. And every time I ride by the school, like I get teary eyed and I just like, I'm in a car and I just start crying. I'm like, thank you, guys. Cause it's just like, it's been a dream forever. Um, and this is, has been the most stressful week of my entire life. Like, finals when Chase was diagnosed like none of that compares to like this mm. week because I'm still working on the application trying to get letters of support can you email me my letter please <laughs> I didn't forget I didn't forget you are on top oh. of my list for tomorrow Thank you. I'm gonna fight um, you for waiting so long to ask me because you knew this day was coming about right, that other right, you know you're yeah. right you're right um but yeah, so it's just been, it's been a very like busy week, but every single time, like I get overwhelmed and I'm get stressed. I just remind myself, like, this is, this is what I've been working for. Like this exact moment and it's happening. And it's just like, it's so amazing. And I just feel like so overwhelmed with like gratitude. Um, and I'm excited because this is a dream. And I really believe that when we have a vision, when like God puts something like in us that's a passion it's supposed to happen and there are so many kids that like i'm supposed to meet in 2022 that are going to walk through the doors mm -hmm. and they're going to be better just because like we're there because i've seen what happens in classrooms when kids are loved and they feel like they belong and they're listened to and just like you said like when kids are treated as actual humans and individuals like yes the magic that happens like in classrooms when they have a teacher that treats them like that the magic that happens inside of school buildings when they have school leaders that believe in them and they're like yo my kids are geniuses and this is what they can do 
is amazing. But I've also seen the flip side. I've seen a classroom mm-hmm. where teachers don't believe in kids and they're like, oh, they can't do that. Yeah. They don't know how to do this. And kids feel defeated and they don't make it happen because nobody believes in them. Um, and this has just been something I've just been, I've known in my heart that I'm supposed to do. This is what I was born for. And it's about to like, it's going to be amazing. And then years i'm gonna be nominated as secretary of education because like, boom how gonna there you go that's how it's <laughs> gonna happen and look let's see eight years from now we're gonna be so biden said he's not gonna run for a second term so five years from now as i said well now five years from now we'll be on um Kyle will be running for her second election hopefully she'll just have been uh re-elected for a second term and so that means that eight years from now, yeah, she'll be on her way out the door. That's when she's just handing out the Howard favors left and right. I'm just kidding. It's not a favor because Courtney was absolutely deserve it, you know. But I'm just saying, your timing is pretty good. Eight years is kind of it's kind of a good time. That's literally I like mean, it can happen if I listen. If he's not going to run for re-election and then she is president, no, eight is perfect because you got it. No, eight is perfect because you got to have you know your resume has to be. You can't be Betsy DeVos. You got to really have some skin in the game. So in eight years, you'll be like, I've had a successful school for seven years. You know, actually, at seven years from now, you could have your school for five years or four years. And you will, at that point, have branched out. I was going to say, your network, by eight years, your network should be expanding. You know, this might be a 12-year plan, but it is an excellent plan nonetheless. Thanks. It's an excellent plan nonetheless. We're starting out as... The school in 2022 will be K-5, Shirley Chisholm Empowerment Charter School. Shirley then, Chisholm Empowerment yes. School. Big up, Shirley. <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. But Empowerment Charter School will be the network. And we'll open um, middle school, high school, preschool, all of that. So, you know, and then I'll be Secretary of Education. And there we are. There you are. There will be. I'm so excited for you, Courtney. So uh, before we get out of here, uh, one, well, two things. One, it wouldn't be fair. I know we're a little bit over time, but it would not be right for us to be here together in this historic moment. This is the first show that I've got to do since it has been officially official, official, official that Kamala Harris is gonna be the vice president because there was the like, we think it's gonna happen, (laughs) we're not sure. And there's still the craziness that's going on right now. We're not gonna ignore uh, the the fact that the president is acting like he's threatening a coup and baiting an assassination. So that's scary Um, and and we shouldn't turn our back on that. Uh, But, you know, in this moment, we stand here during a time in which the vice president elect of the United States is not only uh, a black woman um, and an Indian woman, but also an alumna of our beloved Howard University, where you and I Thank met, you. Uh, yeah. you know. And so <laughs> now that Howard, and because Howard is an HBCU, um, Howard is going to, I think, make news and be a subject of public fascination. And hopefully, you know, specifically as it relates to black kids, especially black Mm -hmm. kids who, you know, like you and I, well, there is a, there's an HBCU near you, but like I grew up in Chicago, so there was no HBCU. Technically, Chicago State University is an HBCU. Like it's part of the network of HBCUs. When we Mm -hmm. talk about colleges that were founded for the education of, 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 Black people, and that also have this history of service in the civil rights movement. Um, there wasn't a school like a Howard or a FAMU or a Spelman or Morehouse near me, right? And so mm-hmm. now, you know, young Black kids across the country, uh, across the world, are going to learn a little something about HBCUs. Mm-hmm. They're going to hear the word Howard in the news um, a little bit more frequently uh, for the foreseeable future. What is the one thing? that you want people who did not have the privilege of attending the Mecca uh, to know about Howard University? Oh, Um, so you know what? I'll share what I shared with Chase and Carter in the car yesterday. And this was actually after I sent you a text. Um, Mm. I, so you respond, for those who don't know, so I asked Jamila to write a letter of support for my school. and your response right after you was like, sure, period. Like that's all, just sure. And 
earlier that day, I had sent another pal a text message, and your response was, sure. And then yeah. the day before- pal, Campus had, Pals organization that we were both a part of at Howard. Um, and the day before, I had sent an email to another person that went to Howard, and literally the response was, absolutely, send it to me. Yeah. And when you sent me your response, it made me a little bit emotional because yesterday I had sent other emails and literally like, hey, here, I can send you the template. Like, all I need you to do is read it, sign it, that's that. And some of the responses I got were like, oh, I can't, I don't have enough time, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, bruh, you don't have to do anything but sign it. And yeah. I told Chase and Carter, I said, the reason I get so emotional about things like this is because every single time I need anything, like it doesn't, it's, it can be something like, can you repost this? Do you know how to do this? What should I say about this? Whatever it is, it, most people, I don't get a positive response where it's like, oh, I don't know, or not a lot of support, but the most support and the strongest support I get are from people that I went to college with. And I share with them, I said, the best, this one of the best <laughs> decisions that I've made was going to Howard. And then the second best decision I made was becoming a campus child because those are the strongest relationships that I have. And I tell them all the time because they they're they know that if you go to Howard, I will pay for college no matter what it is. If you go to an HBCU, I'll help you pay for it and we're gonna get a scholarship. But other mm -hmm. than that, like there are no other options. Um, but I tell them, and they're always like, well, why do we have to go to an HBCU? And Carter says, like, I'm going to Howard, but I just want to know why. And I tell yeah. her, like, there's nothing like being the majority. There's nothing like being in a classroom with people who look like you, who want the same things as you, who just love you for who you are, and they want you to succeed like they want themselves to succeed. And it's just, a, it's the best. And Howard is the mecca of Black education, is the most diverse university there is and it's the best and we only produce greatness you know i just saw the thing that um somebody made a post that said like a bunch of first african americans that did all these great things and it was like and they were howard graduates and i was like yep mm -hmm. and then i'm gonna be the first black woman to be secretary of education like howard graduate that's what it is um but we only produce greatness and it's only great people that come from howard and it's just so amazing it's just such a blessing to be a part of that so yeah. It's definitely a blessing yeah. to be part of that uh, rich tradition of, of service to uh, the world and to the African American community specifically. And yes, it is a rich, it's a family in a way is that, you know, I imagine yeah. most HBCUs function the same way. You know, if we were Absolutely. Fiskites, it'd be the same thing. Like you Absolutely. ask your, your fellow Fisk brother, sister, Clark, like, um, yep. you know, wherever you go. It's like, yep, I got you. And the way we look out for other HBCU folks too. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's typically a matter of kind of like, okay, I look you and I know you for, you know, like we on the same thing. All right, cool. You know, like it, 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 it's, you know, and how we look out for our brothers and sisters in general. I certainly am like not, not looking out for people who didn't go to black colleges <laughs> or who didn't go to college at all. Like that would be ridiculous. But there is a bond that we have with one another that is mm -hmm. special. Um, and it's been mm -hmm. certainly beneficial to us uh, personally and professionally. Courtney, it's been so fun having you here before we go. And I know we're over time, but it, I could not not play the game with you. So there's a game that All we right. play every week. One quick question. And okay. so uh, 60 seconds on the clock. Uh, this mm -hmm. is inspired by something you know well with an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old, especially with an eight-year-old, um, that you know you could be trying to rush out the door to get to church, to get to dinner, to get to school, wherever you're trying to do. Uh, you could be trying to start a Zoom meeting or finish an application. You know, right now time <laughs> is precious. And it's like, wait, let me ask you something right quick. And whatever that <laughs> something is, is very rarely a quick question. Naima has chosen uh, real quick to ask me about sex, like as in what it is, to ask me why Michael Jackson had two very different racial appearances throughout his life, um, to ask me, you know, about her own future. She, you know, she waits till the worst possible time. So I'm yep. going to ask you as many, I'll just, I think it'll be more fun to ask eight year old questions and 12 year old questions, even though I know you're a master of both, but I'm gonna ask you as many questions Ooh, that an eight year old right. might come up with in 60 seconds when you don't have a lot of time to stop and explain. And let's just see how many of them you get through. Are you ready? I'm ready. Maybe. Okay. 
Maybe. I think you're more than ready because you've, you've done this twice. All right, so 60 seconds on the clock. Let's go. Why do you have to start a school? Like, what's wrong with the schools that they already have? Because there are only white females that are teaching and a lot of the schools suck and I can make a better one. Why do you think you can make a better one? Because I'm the shit. So I was thinking, I had an idea since you're starting a school. Oh, wait, one thing I that I, girl, I wouldn't curse. <laughs> I'm your daughter, by the way. I'm also your daughter. Um, <laughs> One thing that I think can maybe make school better is like if you had kids be teachers. So I was thinking since you're the principal of the school you're starting, I would like to be a teacher. I actually think that's a great idea. Maybe not the teacher because teachers need to be certified, but I do think that student centered classrooms are much better and they have much more, a stronger impact than students than classes that are not like that. So I think that'll be a great idea. Where do I start? What does certified mean, mommy? <laughs> so you go to college. All right, you're out of time. <laughs> it's one quick question, Courtney. It's one quick question, Ooh, not a thesis. Jesus. No, but that's great because at least you gave her affirmation. You said, yes, that's a good idea. Not what you said, but something else is a good idea. <laughs> not your idea, but the idea that I have. That's loosely right. related to your idea. The theory around it. The theory, I get what you're saying. You need the kid's perspective here. However, I'm not going to let an eight-year-old teach. Courtney, this has been so much fun to catch up with you in this way. It was like and the office. It was like the Palo office. I'm so excited for you. Please remind everyone the name of uh, your school and your organization, how they can follow you uh, on your journey for both. Please, so please follow the Chase Away Diabetes Foundation, which is X on Instagram, Chase Away Diabetes. Um, and also Shirley Chisholm Empowerment Charter School, which is empowerment underscore 2021. So 2021, both on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, same name, Chase Away Diabetes Empowerment underscore 2021. Thank you so much, Courtney, and good Thank luck you to know. you with both. I'm so excited. I'm so excited for your school. And also, I meant to tell you this offline before, but like I noticed that some of those Chase Away Diabetes events, you'll be having fine athletes there. And so the next time you're going to have some fine <laughs> athletes for your events, just remember that I'm single and mingling. So yes, trying to have absolutely. me one, trying to have one more baby while these eggs are still working. So, you know, right. let me know when COVID yeah. is over, of course. <laughs> When COVID is over, oh, Philly is only a flight away. So Saturday is actually National Diabetes Awareness Day. So please yes. wear blue. And when someone is asking you, let them know why to help us raise awareness and influence advocacy. Saturday, wear your blue. Saturday. Okay, Saturday, we're wearing blue for National Diabetes Awareness Day. And Courtney, I know you'll be sharing stuff on social media and I'll reshare it and all that good stuff. And folks can follow you and support your work. I love you. Thank you for being I here. Um, thank you, audience, for watching. Uh, this has been The Kids Are Asleep. Uh, and for once, my kid is not here, which is why she didn't run through because she ain't <laughs> never going to be. I wish I had a kid who was asleep at seven o'clock uh, local time, but it doesn't work that way. But we had a good time. Thank you so much you for your support. And we will see you next week. Good night, Courtney. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Say good night, Candy Girl. Say good night, Candy Girl. Oh, candy. Oh, she ain't like it. <laughs> she ain't like it. She ain't like it. She went into it. All right. Good night.